Hi, good evening. For those who don't know me, my name is Demela Sacriste, and I'm here with an initiative from Candler School of Theology. In partnership with the Aquinas Center, we are so happy to bring this event to you all. The Candler Foundry is the public theological education arm of Candler, and so we strive to bring the resources that we have at, um, at the School of Theology to the greater community. That includes courses in the community led by our faculty, but also public events that are both accessible and rigorous for those of us that want to continue to explore theology, learn in community, and grow spiritually. So with all of that, I'm going to let you, um, I'm going to introduce you to Greg, the Executive Director of the Aquinas Center, and let him tell you a little bit more about him. Thank you. We're so happy to uh, be doing this in partnership with the Candler Foundry. And if you, hadn't had a, had, if you haven't had a chance to check out what the Catholic Foundry does, you really should check it out. Their website is fantastic. And um, the Aquinas Center is hoping to do even more work in the future uh, with them in partnership. Uh, as Damella said, I'm Greg Hillis. I'm the executive director of the Aquinas Center. If you don't know what the Aquinas Center is, it is a Catholic Studies Center at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And we provide programming throughout Atlanta uh, on various facets of Catholic intellectual, spiritual, moral tradition. And uh, I moved here from Louisville, I'm brand new, uh, and so if you haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, please introduce yourself to me as you're having the wonderful cake and coffee afterwards that we have brought for you. Um, I'm really excited uh, about this event tonight, um, in no small part because even before I moved to Louisville, uh, or sorry, moved to Atlanta from Louisville, um, I had read Susan's book. And uh, it was a book, uh, frankly, that has kind of stayed with me for a while as I've been, uh, after I read it. It's a book that has so many practical and wonderful implications for how we can live in our parishes today. And I know you're gonna love hearing this conversation tonight. So, you need to not hear from me, you need to hear from them. And I want to introduce, introduce you to your St. Thomas More stars. <laughs> First up is Gabby Guerrero. <laughs> Gabby was born and raised in Los Angeles where she graduated with honors from Loyola Marymount University with her BA in Theological Studies. She moved to Atlanta in 2021 to study at Candler and will graduate with her MDiv in the spring of 2024. Gabby has worked for Catholic organizations in a variety of capacities, including for America Magazine, I did not know that, we should talk, and the Holy See's diplomatic office in Vienna, Austria. In April, she assumed her current role on staff here at St. Thomas More as the youth minister. She's deeply compassionate about, or she's deeply passionate about Ignatian spirituality feminist theology, and the valuable perspectives that lay people, especially youth, bring to the church. And she's going to be in conversation with Susan, who I'm going to introduce to you now. Dr. Susan Reynolds is an assistant professor of Catholic studies at Emory University's Candler School of Theology, where she teaches courses in theology, American Catholic history, and congregational studies. She is an award-winning theologian and ethnographer whose work examines Catholic ecclesiology and practice on the margins of the church and society. In addition to her 2023 book, People Get Ready, her work on race, culture, migration, and the church has recently been published in Religion and American Culture, U.S. Catholic Historian, and American Catholic Studies. Her research into clergy sexual abuse among undocumented immigrant communities in Los Angeles during the 1960s and 80s was recently awarded the 2023 Catherine Mowry Lacuna Prize by the Catholic Theological Society of America. She's a contributing writer for Commonweal Magazine and a frequent participant in national conversations on religion and public life 
in media such as NPR, The Washington Post, PBS NewsHour, National Catholic Reporter, and the Jesuit magazine America. Proudly Jesuit ed educated, she is a graduate of Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, where she recently became the first layperson to be honored with the Alumni Distinguished Service Award. Susan, her husband Drew, and their three daughters are also active St. Thomas More parishioners. Here at STM, she can typically be found helping second graders make First Communion banners out of felt, chasing her four-year-old around the narthex during Mass, and most importantly, rehearsing for the upcoming <laughs> STM production of <laughs> The Sound of Music. I just bought tickets for my wife and I. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll give you Susan and Gabby. Thank you so much, Craig and Demelis. Um, I am so excited to be here for this conversation with you. I think I called and texted my mom when I found out, so that's how you know I was really excited. Um, but yeah, this is so meaningful to be able to sit down with you about this incredible book that you wrote. Um, and I'm selfishly especially um, interested and able to sort of imagine myself in uh, the position that you were in. You were 24 when you moved in, right? So I just turned 25. Um, you were a graduate student, um, and you were also like working and living in a parish context, which are all very familiar things to me. Um, so tell us a little bit about where the book came from and how it was born out of your like lived experience as a graduate student in Boston living in the St. Mary's Rectory. Sure, so, um, so the book, People Get Ready, um, began about 12 years ago. And it began when I was a first year MTS student, Master of Theological Studies student, um, at Boston College, and I was moving up from Brownsville, Texas, because I was in Brownsville, I was a teacher living on the border, um, which meant a lot of things, but one of those things was it, it meant that I did not have any money whatsoever. Um, and I was moving to a very expensive city um, to be a graduate student where I would continue to have no money, and I needed a place to live. And, um, and, and I needed a place to live that didn't cost any money. So um, I heard sort of providentially about um, this parish in Roxbury, which is sort of in the inner city um, of, of Boston, if you're familiar with that city. <clears throat> um, and um, they were looking for sort of a minister of presence because like many parishes in Boston, they did not have a priest in residence. Um, there's priest shortage there. Um, and so there was no one living in the rectory. Um, and so they, for a while, it had kind of a series of graduate students, lay people being sort of, you know, kind of ministers of presence, somebody to keep the lights on and make sure the coffee's brewing and answer the door and answer the phone and put together the bulletin and all of those sort of things. Um, and so in exchange for 13 hours a week of work, um, I lived in the parish rectory um, for free. And um, it was this immediate immersion into the daily reality of this very small inner city parish. The first thing that you notice about St. Mary of the Angels when you arrive there um, is that it's underground. So it's a, it's a basement with a roof because they broke ground on the parish in 1906, uh, originally intended to serve sort of Irish, German, working class uh, immigrants in, in this then sort of streetcar suburb of, of Roxbury. And um, these were poor folks, and they did not have very much money to contribute to the building of a parish. Um, so they got the basement done, and then they said, um, this has already taken two years. <laughs> so what if we just put a roof on it, and then we'll raise the rest of the money um, at, while we can, and then we'll finish out the blueprints for a very beautiful sort of neo-Gothic kind of structure. And a um, hundred and several, what, 17 years later, um, it's still a basement with a roof. They never raised the money. Um, uh, in 1987, the original roof, which was flat, which is a great idea in a city where it snows constantly, um, finally caved in. And so then they, now it has a pitched roof. So it, it looks like this sort of stubby building with a, with a roof. And then next door to it is this towering three-story Victorian estate house that was deeded to the archdiocese for $1 um, from the, the estate owners. And that is the rectory and parish house and sort of um, all of the space in the parish. Um, and the, <laughs> the thing, I mean, so aside from the fact that it was a basement uh, with a roof, the, the first 
thing, the other first thing that, that really struck me about St. Mary's um, was that it was so unlike any parish I had ever been to before. Because first of all, it was radically culturally and racially diverse. Um, there was an English mass and a Spanish mass, but within those two sub-communities, um, there's tremendous amount within the English community of racial diversity, um, within the Spanish mass community, folks were there from countries all over Central and South America, and um, Spain and Portugal and um, the Caribbean. Um, in the English mass, there was folks from Jamaica and West Africa um, and, and Ireland and, you know, all, I mean, every, everywhere you could possibly imagine. Um, and unlike most parishes that are sort of multicultural today, what I encountered there was this stunning level of, um, of friendship, like of love, mm -hmm. across all of these sort of borders that, that you could find within this space. Um, and I just, it was like, what's going, what's going on here? What's this, what's the story? How did this come to be? Um, and so I was very intrigued by the, this place that I was now sort of responsible for, um, for opening and closing at the end of each day. Um, and, and that interest grew gradually as I learned more and more about the history of this parish, because as it turned out, this tiny, poor church for the poor, as Pope Francis says, in, in the heart of Roxbury, had played kind of an outsized role in um, struggles for racial justice and economic justice and urban justice. Um, before, during, and after the Second Vatican Council um, in the 1960s and 70s, or 70s and 80s and early 90s, there was a priest there who was sort of a city priest named Jack Rusin, who was kind of one of the most important organizers um, for peace building in, in Boston at that time. He worked closely with uh, youth and gangs. Um, a number of other organizers had come through this parish. Um, it just, it, it had this sort of larger than life legacy, even though it was like a tinier than life parish. Um, so the more I read about its history, the more intrigued I became. Um, and eventually the, um, uh, they, every Good Friday, they do um, a, a Stations of the Cross, a way of the cross through the heart of the, of the neighborhood. We're gonna talk about that later, I think. But that, that became the subject of my master's thesis, um, which, uh, and, then I, and then I wrote my dissertation based on a, on a deeper study of the parish, um, and then that became the book. Um, so it, it started, it started because I needed a place to live, um, and, the, and the story sort of found me there, um, and I'm and I'm really glad it did. Thank you so much. What a like, you know, you gave us in that like a history and ethnography and like a, a very clear visual of even the physical structure of the parish. So thank you for <laughs> such a rich answer to start. Um, so you know, you talked a lot about the the rectory and and in your description of the of St. Mary's Rectory in the book. Uh, when you describe it, you write that the house belonged to everyone, which was something that I really loved. I loved that image and how it represented the way that the lay community like understood their role in the life of the parish. Um, how did living in a rectory, which is obviously a space um, intended for priests, as a young lay engaged woman reorient your understanding of the church and the life of the parish? Yeah, living in the parish house was, was a real gift because it enabled me for the first time in my life to, to experience the life of a parish from mm -hmm. the inside out. Um, most scholarly accounts of parish life, whether they're theological or sociological, um, there's a lot of sociology based in, in parishes um, because parishes actually are very unique um, structures within the organizational and congregational life of the United States, right? There's a reason why we call most Protestant churches, for example, congregations, right? Because they're voluntary. You, you decide, I wanna go to that church and I am not beholden to go to this church mm -hmm. just because it happens to be next door to me. I can choose where I'm going to go. Um, parish structure, and of course we don't all follow this anymore, but theoretically, right, parish structure is like public schools, right? I mean, it's you're, you have boundaries and you live within the boundaries of a parish and that's your parish. And in turn, that parish is responsible uh, for the pastoral care and spiritual care of all of the souls within its boundaries. Um, which is first, which is really, really interesting. I mean, the other thing about that too is it subtly kind of um, it, it it affirms like local dwelling mm -hmm. and, and local belonging, um, and also as a result of this, Catholic parishes in the United States are one of the most, if not the most, on average, um, diverse, uh, the most diverse um, 
religious congregation, type of religious congregation in the United States, um, which is also really unique and really, really interesting. Um, so parishes are very interesting spaces, but most historical or sociological or few theological accounts based in parishes are written um, by, by priests, by, you know, either folks who are primarily working as priests or more, more frequently priests who are like academics and, you know, um, they don't necessarily lead with that, but nevertheless, you know, if you're wanting to do a deep dive into a community, like an ethnographic account, you need, you, first of all, you need access to that community. Um, and, and then second of all, you need some role that makes you legible to the community. Because mm -hmm. like, hello, I'm here from the university and I'd like to study yeah. what you have, you know, that's not really, no one really wants that around. <laughs> so <laughs> it's helpful if you have some purpose for being there. Um, and truly, I mean, nearly every book that's, uh, that, that's sort of based on a deep study of a parish is written by a priest. Mm -hmm. um, and so just the fact that I was able to be a, a young woman, a young lay person in, in this space was, was meaningful to me. And it really felt, I mean, it felt like a deep gift. And the interesting thing about this parish is because the rectory was contiguous with basically the entirety of um, the parish's gathering space, um, a, a lot of people had access like that. So it wasn't just me that was like, oh, I'm this insider now. Um, you know, people were coming and going all the time. Community groups met in mm -hmm. the first floor of the parish house, like ecumenical um, coalitions, anti-violence coalitions, like every, all of the, you know, the pastor, the parish pastoral council and the finance council and neighbors. And it was like, it really was this community space. And it was, it felt like this very sort of fluid belonging between like church and community and neighborhood. Um, and it was something that was really lovely to be a part of. And I, there was, I, I just remember like there was something very special about, you know, like in my, in my bedroom above the office, you know, listening to the noises of the streets. And, you know, in the morning I would come downstairs and the, the chapel was in the parish house too. There's like a small chapel where we'd have daily communion services mm -hmm. mostly, um, not, not masses because um, we only had a priest once a week. So um, uh, my roommate, I had a roommate, my roommate and I would lead communion services in the mornings. Um, but I was, of course, a 24 year old grad student. So if I didn't have to lead, I was not awake. So I would sort of stumble down, you know, in yeah. my sweatpants or whatever, like halfway through. And I'm like, oh, oh they're still praying. Okay. I don't know anything mm. about that. Yeah, I know, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, no, always crack of er yeah. early to bed, early to rise, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, you know, and then, you know, the communion service would be ending and all of the old parish ladies who, you know, would be getting out and then they'd come over to the kitchen and have some coffee and turn on the TV and watch The Price is Right. And it was just <laughs> like, it was, it felt very holy to be in this space where, you know, there was a very thin boundary between church and everyday life. Um, I felt, I felt fortunate and I, I still feel fortunate to have had that experience. It was, it was it was really beautiful. It changed how I think about church. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. The, the, what comes through for me is the, yeah, the blending of the holy and the ordinary mm -hmm. and sort of the fluidity of space in a space that is traditionally, like I used to say about the Jesuit community at LMU, that they were like reverse vampires. You had to be invited in. You couldn't, you couldn't go in unless you were invited. So yeah, there's really something there about I, I agree space. with you. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. Reverse vampires. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the book argues that uh, Catholic ecclesiology has largely neglected the experience of communities on the ground. Can you first uh, define ecclesiology for us? Ecclesi I'm going to put that on you because usually I'm a student, so I'm Eccle asking you a question. Ecclesiology is the theology of church. Yes. It, is, it is our theology about what church means. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so why don't you then tell us what you mean by that and why that matters to ordinary Catholics like here at SDM in our in our day to day lives? Yeah, um, I think the book is I would say it's a book about what it means to be church in the face of reality, um, you know, in the face of injustice and, and division and violence and, and also like the much sort of milder but more inescapable reality of like what it means to be church um, with a lot of people who are different than mm -hmm. you and, um, and, and some of them like maybe you don't like 
very much. <laughs> and other, and others you do, and others you have conflict with, and others speak a different language than you, um, and some ha have a different theology than you, um, a different spirituality than you. Like, what is? How do we? How do we be church? And I think it challenges us. I think to embrace the power that we have as lay people to really transform the church and, and transform our communities. Um, we can talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess I hope. I hope that it offers a fresh way of thinking theologically and historically about, about what it means to be a community of, of difference. Um, so that's the ecclesiological piece. Why it matters, um, I'll say this. When I, I've always loved parishes, like, I've, like always, like since I was like a, a, a very little girl. I, like, I've always loved parishes. My, my siblings and I, every summer, would, um, we would go, my parents would um, send us off to, to stay with my great aunts in this little farm and post-industrial town called Streeter, Illinois, which is where generations of my family grew up, um, kind of hour and a half south of, of Chicago, kind of dropped in the middle of the cornfields. And, um, and the thing that um, was sort of the center of this, this town um, was, the, was the parish, and not just any parish, the first Slovak parish in America. Very cool. Yeah. How's that for a distinguished, <laughs> distinguished family legacy? Um, St. Stephen's Catholic Parish, so my family, of course, is Slovak, and, um, and they were part of this tiny town, this first settlement of, of Slovak Catholics, and so my brother, and then later my sister, who's much younger than me, we would go, my parents would kind of ship us off, and um, we t I told my third grade teacher that we would do church, I think I told her we'd do old lady things, <laughs> with a completely straight face. I was like, do old lady things. Um, what does that mean? We'd go to daily mass, <laughs> get up, go to daily mass. At four o'clock, we'd go pray the rosary in the parish center. Um, we would, most excitingly, work um, the rummage sale, the, the Altern Rosary Society rummage sale that lasted all summer for some reason um, and everything sold for like five cents so I'm not really sure how this was a fundraiser in any meaningful capacity. No. it was more just like a swap of everyone's things yeah. in the whole town all summer long and of course it was like a treasure hunt for my brother and I there were these like tunnels that went under the parish that we like you know, and, and that's where they would put all the stuff that had yet to be sorted, and it was like, oh my gosh, and I, you know, and there's old statues down there, and it's spooky, and there's like old thurible's, and I, I just, I don't know, I lo I loved it because everything was so tactile and old and dusty, and everything had a story, and I would always get really invested in the drama between all of the altar and rosary society ladies. <laughs> By the end of the summer, I would know everything about, you know, Marge and whoever else, and um, she didn't. And, um, and so even, it really formed my imagination as a, as a young kid, um, like in a really deep way. It was kind of this immersion into this, this really lovely Catholic life. I'll say, I, growing up, I, I had a very hard childhood, and I, I remember, um, these summers in Streeter as like just this beautiful time. And, um, and so it always just was really into parishes. And actually another story for you is, this is just autobiographical at this point, but um, when I was in, it, was, it had to have been like sophomore year of high school, we were learning about satire. And I wrote my satire piece about my first reconciliation. <laughs> I was in public school. <laughs> Oh, this was fun. And there was one other Catholic girl, my friend Lauren, and she read it and she laughed so hard that she started crying. And it was this moment of like, oh, we can do this. You know, yeah. we can, this can, we can write about real stuff in ways that are really, really fun. Um, and so it was kind of a vocational moment. So that's, uh, suffice it to say, I've always, I really have always loved parishes and been very fascinated by them. But in theology, in academic theology, parishes do not hold pride of place at all. Usually, if parishes are mentioned um, in 
theological texts, as I'm sure you have no shortage of on your syllabi right now. Sure. It's usually a, some sort of pastoral afterthought, mm -hmm. like here's how you apply this in a parish setting. Or even where it's usually as a contrast, like, well, this is what the high-minded theology says, but the people in the pews. Yeah. The people, what are the, like, let's, let's relate this to the people in the pews, you know, like they're five, I don't know, like what, I don't, I hate that. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I, I hate that for a lot of reasons, but, but mostly because parishes are theological spaces. Like, there's all kinds of theological questions that are happening in parishes. Like, how do we understand the meaning of community and, and solidarity across difference, right? How do we understand authority mm -hmm. in the church? What's the relationship between religion and culture? What does the Eucharist mean? What are, what is, why is sacramentality important? Like, what does ritual do? Like, what do we mean by church? These are, like, these are fundamental theological questions, and yet theology, by and large, has completely neglected the parish, um, even as a site of concern, much less as, like, a theological source. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I try to do in the book is use some properly theological sources to pose a series of questions about the limits of our language when it comes to unity and diversity in the church. Um, and then use another set of what I would argue are properly theological sources, right? Social histories, archival documents, interviews, participant observation, ritual observations in a parish setting mm -hmm. to, to answer that question. Um, and, and I think it works. <laughs> it's definitely works. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There's so, yeah, there's so much there. I love the, the doing old lady things. I know. I just just totally it. straight face. I know, and I'm sure my teacher loved that. Yeah. She was not a young lady. Totally. So, yeah. Yeah. Lady things. Rosary. I still do old lady things. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. Um, you, you talk in, you know, in, that, in your last answer about unity and diversity, which is something that we talk about a lot in the broader church as a way of talking about how we are all members of one body. Um, however, uh, in the book, uh, you take issue with a communion theology that glorifies a sort of like post-racial vision of Christian community and like completely ignores difference. Um, how do you view a uh, theology of solidarity instead as an antidote to this sort of colorblind understanding of communion? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a little background to communion ecclesiology. Um, communion ecclesiology around the 1980s became the sort of de facto um, Catholic ecclesiology, the de facto Catholic theology of church, in part because the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith um, said that it was. And that's an interesting thing to do. Um, because, of course, after Vatican II, as I obviously remember, um, just kidding, um, it's in the 1960s, yeah. uh, uh, you know, what kind of one of the most um, vital outcomes, I think, in terms of what people appropriated from the council was this notion of the church as the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, that was theological, deeply biblical. It's Hebrew Bible language. I mean, this is old, old, old language. Uh, for understanding one, you know, our, our collective relationship with God. Um, and Lumen Gentium, the, the um, document in Vatican II on the church, um, defined the church as the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, and this was very compelling, especially in the 1960s, right? Because it was very like, we're democratizing this, like people, power to the people, social change, this is great. Um, but um, the Vatican became concerned that we were swinging a little bit wide in the people of God <laughs> direction. And they're like, we need to clarify the outcomes of the council. So in 1985, uh, there was an extraordinary synod of bishops called to clarify the outcomes of the Second Vatican Council 20 years after its conclusion. And the conclusion that they came to was that, in fact, um, the way that we should understand um, Vatican II's theology of church was through the language of communion. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, I love communion. I think communion is great. Communion's lovely. Nothing against communion. However, in practice, um, not just in theology, but also like in pastoral writing and um, you know, pastoral manuals and in bishop statements, um, the notion that the church's communion became sort of um, co-opted essentially mm -hmm. to 
to privilege this notion that, well, we're all one in Christ, are we not? We are, we are one at the baptismal font, are we not? We are one in the Eucharist, are we not? And therefore, mm. we're not saying questions of power and racism and economic injustice and all. We're not saying those aren't important. We're just saying like they're not ecclesiological questions. Like these, these are, those are for the social justice committee. Um, but here we're talking about church. Um, and I think that's a really big problem because if we look at reality, let's call it reality, um, or history, um, what we see is that these are the very things that are, that are the source of the deepest wounds in our community. Questions of power, questions of abuse, questions of racism, questions of sexism, etc. And, and I think that we need to take those seriously as, as ecclesiological, but as challenges to the way that we understand church theologically. But if church is sort of this already completed, um, you know, moment of harmony uh, in our lives, then there's really no room within that conversation to discuss these, these searing wounds, these searing injustices. So in the book, I go back to the documents of Vatican II and retrieve the language of solidarity mm -hmm. um, out, sort of out of its, um, its bracketed, you know, let's, that's for social justice, that's for ethics, that's for Catholic social thought, mm -hmm. and say solidarity is also for ecclesiology. Because if you read the documents of Vatican II together, it's clear that when we're talking about solidarity, we're not just talking about what the social justice cluster should do on their summer immersion trip, right? We're talking about what we should be doing within these walls. Right. Um, the church should be a school of solidarity. Um, this should be the place where we learn how to be in communion with one another across all kinds of differences. Because if we can't do it here, then we sure as heck can't do it out there. Um, and I, I, I'm always, the, whenever my students ask, they push on solidarity. Because um, it's one of those terms that, like everything, kind of, you know, it gets softened with overuse. You know, like solidarity, yeah. whatever, what is that? You know, it takes, the, like, the edge, it loses the edge. Um, and I always, I point them to this piece by Sean Copeland, very, um, just like a, one of the most important living theologians today, recently retired from Boston College. She calls, um, in a piece on, on uh, black feminist theology and, um, and, and the call to solidarity, she calls solidarity a, a wrenching task. Mm. I just, that language feels so right. Like it's a, it's, solidarity is hard. Like it's hard to look at somebody who is very different from you or holds very different opinions or comes from a very different context than you and say, I authentically believe that my salvation is bound up with you, with mm -hmm. yours, like in, a, in an earthly way, in an ultimate way, but also in an earthly way, right? It's like that Jane Addams quote for all of you social workers out there. My husband's a social work professor. Um, that like the, 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 the quote about the common, maybe you, I'm, I'm talking like you know this quote, like off the top of your head. But there's a, she has this really powerful quote um, about the, you know, the, the, the goods of, of our society only become good, essentially, when they're one for all, mm. you know. Um, and I think like that's, for me, that feels like a really important ecclesiological aspiration. Um, and in, in some way, that's when I think of the extent to which the church is, is holy, mm -hmm. right? It's how are we growing into community um, across, across real difference. I love the language of the wrenching task from Sean Copeland. She's, yeah, she's amazing. Um, of solidarity and also this idea that like of earthly and, and salvation just being bound up in each other. And I think that one of the practices that you really, I mean, you spend a lot of time on, you spend a whole chapter on in the book, um, is uh, St. Mary's Way of the Cross. Um, the cover of the book features one of the parishioners hauling that massive wooden cross um, uh, through the streets of Boston. Um, and this, this practice, also known as the Stations of the Cross, which is something we've done here um, at mm -hmm. STM, uh, the group, it's a group meditation on the passion of Jesus that ritually re retraces his steps. Um, so can you talk a bit about your experience of walking the way of the cross with St. Mary's community? Yeah, I would love to. So, um, and this was, as I mentioned, this was the very first piece of this mm -hmm. I wrote. I mean, it's completely not the same as it as it was when it was my MTS thesis but that's that's where the book started yeah. was what's now chapter four in 2013 um, 
So every Good Friday, since at least the 1970s, um, this community uh, performs for itself, practices the Stations of the Cross, the Way of the Cross, through the streets of, the, of its neighborhood. They, it's a neighborhood called Eggleston Square. And so each year, um, folks get together and sort of talk about where, where did we live the passion mm -hmm. this year in our community? Where were, the, where were the places of suffering and death and resurrection um, in our own midst? And then they create a route out of that. Um, and so on Good Friday, it's a big, it's actually made of cardboard <laughs> so that it can be easily carried. Um, but it's big, it's a big cross. We start in the church um, and then in 14, stations, places throughout the community. The community sort of walks through the middle of, you know, very busy streets um, in, in Roxbury. It's like a very interruptive kind of prophetic practice, um, ritually sort of retracing the story of the community's own passion in the language of the Stations of the Cross, which is, I think, this really powerful way of, um, first of all, kind of claiming divine solidarity mm -hmm. and saying also, like, these are, these are crosses, right? right? This gang violence isn't just like a, a social problem or a crime issue. Like this is a, this is a way that our community is being crucified. Mm -hmm. um, and to claim something like that as a, as a cross, right, is also to, to claim oneself as, as one who hopes to rise mm -hmm. um, with, with Jesus. Um, and, and it also, it's, in some way, it's, a, it's an affirmation of the, the reality of struggles that are so often overlooked or misinterpreted by broader society, by the media. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a mode of storytelling um, for people using this language that's so central and so sacred um, to, to all of us. <coughs> and that's it, it, it. One thing about it too that I found very, very powerful is that it was this very um, ecumenical and inter faith practice. So it's, it was organized by folks at, at this parish. Um, but it um, always involved other churches, both mm -hmm. Catholic and non-Catholic, as, as stops, as sites. Um, a lot of community folks would walk with us. Um, and it was really, it was so, it was very, very powerful. And that also was a piece of it that had been going on since the 70s. Um, a, a story, I'll tell a story that sort of looms really large in the, in the memory of the community. In, um, in 1990, the gang epidemic in Boston uh, had reached its, its apex. Um, I mean, literally hundreds of kids, died, young people, mostly men, died that year um, from gunshot wounds, mm -hmm. and a lot of the, that was, was gang related. And, um, and a, not a small number of those families were parishioners mm -hmm. at St. Mary the Angels. Um, and so they, they, talking to folks who were there then, like just how many young people they buried. Um, but one young man um, who was a member of the youth group um, was uh, in a in a exchange that was um, was hard to to decipher, I guess, in the days afterwards. He was killed um, by police, and um, a couple days um, uh, after Thanksgiving, November of 1990, mm -hmm. and. Um, and it kind of, it, the neighborhood erupted, right? Because as we know too well today, you know, when you have a, a police killing, um, you know, it's, it's, it ignites a whole, a whole set of questions um, about, you know, police community relations and justice, not to mention the, the tragedy of, of a 19 year old dying. Um, and um, that, that following Good Friday, um, in March of the following year, um, they processed, everyone processed to the, um, to the corner where he was killed. And um, his mother, it was the, the fourth station, right? Jesus meets his mother. And so his mother um, offered the reflection at that station. Um, and it's, I, the, a wild part of the research process was I actually found, I'd seen various photos of this particular ritual from like the Boston Globe and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I found by chance a, an unbelievable photo of this procession um, on, on eBay, of all things. It was, I guess, the Boston Herald. The Boston Herald is like the New York Post of Boston. It's like 
the like kind of more tabloid kind of like bad newspaper, yeah. but apparently at that time they had a very robust photojournalism <laughs> situation. Sure. But I guess they sort of, at some point, emptied their archives and sold them off. And I found um, this, this photo of um, the Jack Rusin, who was the city priest there, um, and the community marching, processing past this mural that Hector Morales, who was the boy who was killed, and his friends had helped to paint the summer before in a, in a gang diversion mm -hmm. project. Um, and it was just, I mean, it was this sort of stunning, like, yeah, a very interruptive image. Um, but I think that's, that ritual for me kind of encapsulates what was so special about this parish, was this sort of sense of continuousness from, you know, church to neighborhood. It was really this sense of we're all here mm -hmm. for each other, right? We're here. The church is in the street and it wasn't the sense of like we're going to bring the cross to the streets and like sanctify them and right. make this sac you know secular space holy for a for but a brief moment on good friday it was like no that like in some way like this also was church mm -hmm. um and all like this whole all of it all of this space is is space where god is um for me it was very it was very moving thank you Wow, yeah, that, I mean, the ways, the Station of the Cross is, is heavy to begin with, so to sort of, like, marry it to the community's mm -hmm. stories and wounds, like, just such a powerful, I can imagine such a powerful experience. It's very powerful. So, you've told a few stories about different members, um, but talking about, you know, your own story and the stories of other women in the parish, um, just in talking about access that lay women have to the inner workings of the church, um, you wrote that women may be the heartbeat of parish ministry, but our authority and access stops at the rectory door. Um, can you talk about some of the particular ways that the women of St. Mary's were able to shape the life of the parish and what the broader church can learn from their contributions? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. Gabby and I share, among many things, a, a concern for the role of women in the church. Yes, and um, I'll tell you a story, actually, first. So this was a very diverse community, of course. Um, and um, so typically there was English mass, Spanish mass, but on cer certain feast days, especially during Holy Week, things like that, there's bilingual masses, which was a really beautiful opportunity for the community to, to sort of share in, in common liturgical life together. And um, on uh, Palm Sunday, there was this tradition I came to find um, that instead of reading the um, the passion narrative, mm -hmm. um, they would perform a mime to it, mm. yeah, like um, with music. It was like ten minutes long, music, and it was highly choreographed. Right, this might sound like that's crazy, but in there, in many cultures, mm -hmm. right, in many Catholic cultures, liturgical dance and things like that are are like um, very treasured parts of of um, devotional expression, and are very natural. Like that, if it would not be surprising or weird. Um, and so this was something that the community did because they said, well, the pa I mean, the passion narrative is so long. Um, and <laughs> so long. Very long. Um, yeah. And, um, and it's liturgically and also for, for time, you don't want to, um, you, don't, you don't translate in the mass, right? You read, if you're doing a bilingual liturgy, you don't, you don't read something in English and then in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just, you kind of go, and then ideally you're, you're providing translations for the pieces that aren't in people's native languages. Um, but then you're only understanding half of what's going on, even though we all know the story, but mm -hmm. it's still, and then you have to have, you know, because there's the readers and there's the priest and this and that, and then, you know, like, crucify him and everything. You know, it's, it, and then you need eight people to read because it's the different languages and it's a whole thing. So they're like, how about we just don't say anything at all and we just perform it because people are gonna hear this again on Good Friday, they're gonna hear it again, they're gonna do this in the streets. Like, we got, we know the story. Yeah. So we're gonna perform it um, and, um, they don't do this anymore, but that this is what they did. And they had been doing it a long time when I was there. And um, to my surprise, <laughs> um, I was told that um, I would be um, portraying Jesus. And I was like, what? Um, I love this in theory, but also I feel like this is going to be very controversial. I'm not really here to... 
I don't want to be controversial. I'm just the girl in the parish house, you know, and I was, you know, I was like, oh, I love this in theory, but I do, I do not want to do this. Um, but, uh, but then the organizers explained to me um, that, oh, no, actually, we, we often have a woman portray Jesus because we want to give voice to the fact that, you know, in our community, women are the ones who carry the heaviest crosses. And I'll mm-hmm. say the English-speaking community at this parish was very sort of, like, pro- progressive, we'll say. But the Spanish-speaking community theologically was not, um, you know. So this wasn't just sort of like the misguided brainchild of, like, you know, like some well-meaning white women. No offense to all of us. Um, but, um, you know, it was, this was coming from, from the folks in the Spanish-speaking community who were organizing this, and I thought, okay, well, I actually do trust you, so mm-hmm. sure, let's do it. Um, but the parish council meeting, a couple weeks later, the, the pastor at that point was a, a diocesan priest, so most of the, the masses are said by Jesuit priests, um, and they always have a couple Jesuit deacons from Boston College who are sort of assigned to them. Um, they're always South American deacons, so they work really closely with the Spanish community. So it's kind of like a de facto Jesuit parish, but because it's a diocesan parish, they always have a diocesan pastor who, because it's Boston, is also responsible for the administration of two other parishes at the same time, so you can imagine how much attention everyone gets. Not very much. And so this guy, this gentleman, this priest, was, um, this, sir, distinguished gentleman, was, um, <laughs> was um, he was very short-lived because he was like, I cannot do this, uh, which is fair. Uh, it was a lot. Um, he was like, absolutely not. Under no circumstances are we doing this. And he, um, he was Mexican-American, and he said, this would scandalize the Hispanic community. They don't, this is too, you know, this is progressive white person stuff. This is not, the Spanish community is more traditional. Like, no. And people are like, no, that's not, no, this is our tradition. We've been doing this. And he's like, no, no. He was just uncomfortable with it. He was just grasping for whatever. So anyway, I did not have to slash get to portray Jesus in the Passion Mime. Um, a man was chosen, which was really interesting for me because I graduated from Our Lady's University, the University of Notre Dame. I had, did not have a very highly developed critical feminist consciousness at that point in my life. And this truly was, I mean, and so like, you know, people would talk about, should we ordain women? And I'm always like, no, I think, you know, well, we do like, well, I think we're good. <laughs> I we think it's stuff. fine. Yeah. Um, women have many roles in the church. And, um, and this was the first time as like a 24 year old that I, that the certain absurdity of the fundamental thing about Jesus being his, his anatomy, mm-hmm. his, the, the fact of maleness, it, it suddenly struck me in a way that it hadn't before, of like, hmm. Like, did I actually want to be in the passion mind? No, I did not. But at the same time, when they were like, you can't do that because you're a woman, it was like, you know, that's interesting. That's interesting to me. And it became even more interesting because then on Good Friday, take the cross to the streets, and who can stand in the person of Jesus in the streets? A woman? a kid, mm-hmm. a, a, you know, a gay man, a teenager, a kid, you know, and it was like, this is, it was interesting to me because I think it also revealed the, what's possible in a parish, what's not possible in a parish, but with a parish. Um, and just this, it, it, more than anything, I think it revealed to me this sort of, it, this dance, I think that women are always sort of doing in mm-hmm. the church. Um, you know, when, when and when are we not made in the image of God? In what spaces? In what times? So, um, so, that's, so, I, so that's a story, I think, that sort of answers the question and illustrates um, just some of the ambivalences, I think, that are there. Um, anytime you're, you're doing anything that involves a certain kind of authority mm-hmm. um, in the church as a woman. Thank you. That like spoke to my oh, but when are we when are we not made in the image of God? It is yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's very interesting when people take the most interesting or the most significant thing about Jesus as being his maleness. I always find that quite interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. That's what I'm saying. I'm getting, oh, Greg is saying five minutes. Is that right? Or are you saying stop? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do, let's do the sex abuse crisis one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so here at St. Thomas More, there was a significant response uh, from our parishioners in, uh, to the 2018 uh, publication of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report on clergy sexual abuse. Um, People Get Ready obviously takes place in Boston, where we think of the Boston Globe spotlight reports as the first major moment in the contemporary clergy sex abuse crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you learn about clergy sexual abuse from your research? And how do classism and racism play a part in that uh, story in that context? Yeah, that's a great question. So I arrived in Boston in 2011, Mm -hmm. so about nine years post Spotlight. Um, And it it was really stunning to me how much the reality of clergy sexual abuse had really decimated faith and trust um, in the institution of the church. And and also, and subsequent, I mean, as a result, it, it had really it had decimated parish life mm-hmm. um, among Boston Catholics, both the sex abuse crisis and then three years later, there was a massive shutdown of about a quarter of Boston's parishes in 2004, um, which St. Mary of the Angels, this tiny parish, was one of very few parishes to successfully protest their closure. And that is a cool story mm-hmm. for a different t- question. Um, but um, yeah, it, was, I, it wasn't on my mind so much when I, you know, because I wasn't from Boston, I was new, but it it quickly became clear to me that this was sort of the, the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, it became really impossible, and I I interviewed a lot of people for the book and everything, and it it was impossible to talk about the church in the inner city without talking about clergy sexual abuse. Um, So in in the study of clergy sexual abuse, there's a a term for a dynamic that's become known as the geographical solution. Um, and that, what that term means, the geographical solution, is a, a way of naming the dynamic of bishops or superiors dealing with abusive clergy, known abusive clergy, by sending them to remote rural dioceses, often in the Southwest or the Northwest or Alaska, often to Native American reservations, um, sometimes internationally to missions in Latin America and Africa and elsewhere. Um, and it turned these receiving communities right into, into what's been called dumping ground. This is a, a kind of a term in the literature, a dumping ground mm-hmm. um, for, for abusive priests. Um, and it, it also, I mean, it's just, it's a devastating thing to contemplate because what it says is that these communities were viewed as disposable um, by those tasked with, with serving the people of God. And what I discovered as I wrote this book, and this was one of the most sort of like stunning discoveries that I made doing archival work in the Archdiocese of Boston's archives, was that the same dynamic was at play in inner cities. And it was at play actually long before Vatican II. So St. Mary's, for example, was stuck with the same nightmare of a pastor for 37 years. 37 years with the same pastor, this, this gentleman, Charles Finnegan, diocesan priest, was the pastor at St. Mary's, um, this tiny basement parish, from like the 19-teens to the 1950s. And this is despite, and it's, archives are crazy things, because it's, I've, I've heard historical research described as reading dead people's mail, and that is what you, that is what you do in an archive, you read dead people's mail. Yeah. And if something gets sent to the chancery, they save it, and they file it, and then you get to go in and read it. <laughs> and it's very, very interesting. Um, and what I found was decades of letters from parishioners, from community members, from local merchants that he had, whatever, screwed over, wronged, um, wronged um, from other priests at the parish saying, you need to get this guy out of here because he's terrible. It, it doesn't, I don't think he was sexually abusive, but he was verbally abusive. He was very erratic. He was just a tyrant and, um, and, and, he, and nothing was done um, at all. In fact, um, sometimes the letters were, were turned over to him. He said, oh, somebody wrote in and said this about you, Father. And then, of course, he would take out the anger on you know, the, the community, basically. So by the time the 60s roll around, 
the community is in, in shambles yeah. um, because it's been so pastorally neglected and pastorally abused. Um, and what's ironic is that by the 60s, and this happened to other parishes in Roxbury as well, because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't sort of the, the epicenter of, of you know, so-called inner city life until the 60s, but starting in the 30s, Boston, or Roxbury became the first site of African-American settlement from the Great Migration in Boston. And then it became the first site of Puerto Rican settlement. So right, there's like, these, it's not a coincidence. And by the 60s, you have church leaders lamenting the sorry state of the church in Roxbury, which is very ironic because it was a situation that they had conspired to produce. Right. Um, because by then it had become this epicenter of urban poverty that Roxbury was sort of like a, to talk about Roxbury was to talk about like the scourge of the inner city. Um, so there was a, um, even the archdiocese, you know, there was, there was, uh, there's this document called the Roxbury Report, which is like a 1960s era report on like inner city poverty in the church. And then there was Roxbury Apostolate. And so like Roxbury was like this sort of code word for everything that's going bad in the city right now. Um, which again was interesting because when white Catholics moved out of the city to the suburbs, in a, in a real way, the church moved with them mm -hmm. in terms of resources, in terms of personnel, in terms of buildings, and, and the inner city was left really, really neglected. Um, again, ironic because most of these inner city parishes were built to serve folks who were then poor immigrants, right? The commitment was there in the 19, uh, you know, the, the 19th century and the early 20th century, but when, when White Catholics made a preferential option for the mm -hmm. suburbs. The, the church in Boston kind of, kind of followed them. Um, and the most stunning thing of all was, was this. So during those years, the 60s and 70s, the Roxbury clergy would occasionally get together to like discuss the problems that they were facing and make demands from the archdiocese that were like ignored and then they would do it all over again. And in the minutes from a meeting in June 1976, um, which I discovered in the, in the Archdiocesan Archives, a priest at St. Joseph's, which was a nearby um, Roxbury Parish that has since been consolidated and combined and closed, um, no longer is there. Where he complained, according to the meeting minutes, that the bishops seemed to be sending so-called displaced priests to the inner city in Boston. Displaced, this is a code word for folks who had done bad things and were sent away, um, but not arrested. And the remark is striking because the priest who said it, according to these meeting minutes, was named Father Doja Wilson, um, who had been ordained in the Diocese of Albany and had himself been displaced to Boston after he was accused of, right, rightfully accused of abusing two boys in Albany. So the bishop in Albany and the DA in Albany agreed to let him leave the area rather than facing prosecution. Um, so he became parish administrator of St. Joseph's in Roxbury under the auspices of Boston Cardinal Medeiros, famed author of Man's Cities and God's Poor. And in Roxbury, um, he was also accused of sexual abuse. So he was sent to a treatment center in Worcester and left in 1979. So the thing that I've learned, and this was really, this was, it was, um, this was one of those things that really came from the documents that just sort of was like, oh, wow, I was not looking for this. Mm -hmm. um, so I've learned that, that in cities and places like Boston and places like Los Angeles and a lot of other places, right? It's, we talk a lot about clericalism, right? Like when we talk about clergy sexual abuse and how do we transform the church, like we talk about clericalism. Um, it's like sort of this notion that the priest is sort of, um, ontologically separate from the faithful. Mm -hmm. but, but what I learned is that clericalism doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? It trades on these other social structural sins like racism, like xenophobia, like sexism, like classism. And the victims who are most silenced, right, the victims who are most ignored are, are those victims who are in the crosshairs of mm -hmm. this kind of racialized discrimination. Oh, yeah. Not a happy note to end on. <laughs> Somebody asked something nicer. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. The, the book is a gift, and you are a gift to this community in Candler. So you are a gift to this oh, community. I, thank this you. Is such a this is such a privilege.
That was a wonderful. We can do Q&A from audience, right? Do yeah. you need my mic? What's that? Do you need my microphone? No, I'm going to, um, for the live stream, I'm going to um, ask. We're going to have about 10 minutes for questions. And so if you have any questions, you can ask, and then I'm probably going to repeat it for the people on live stream so that they can hear uh, what questions you might have. Questions? Yes, sir. So that's a pretty tame question. Uh, that was um, uh, the the question was for those of you on the live stream or didn't hear. Um, when was it that uh, it was determined that within the Catholic Church and some other historical churches that the males only would be ordained? And is there any hope of that changing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, where do I start? Um, what I will say, so in terms of the hope for change, one thing that is happening right now, um, sort of in conjunction with the Synod on Synodality, perhaps you've heard of it, um, is uh, a, a reanimation of, um, toward, toward the desired retrieval of the history that exists in the Catholic Church of women deacons. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, we have a well-documented history of, of women being ordained as deacons, not as like some other like deaconess, like no, deacon, right, deacons. Um, there's a, a number of, both in scripture and in history, in the history of the saints, or Catholic, no, Christian, Catholic women, um, there's a robust diaconate. Um, and this is not, it's not in historical dispute at all, um, but it's a practice that was eventually lost um, within the church um, because of patriarchy. And, um, and there's a movement now to, to reinvigorate, to retrieve the, the ordained diaconate for women. Um, and that, I think, is a really promising place to start. Another, uh, another gift that I would like to see Catholics embrace um, in, in ever-increasing uh, fullness is, is women preaching. Um, I, I had never, I don't think I'd ever preached until I got to Candler, um, and I was invited to preach at chapel several times. Um, I've been, I've, I've preached here, um, at, for a communion service, and I offered an Advent reflection, homily, a couple of years ago at the invitation of, of Father Mark. Um, I, I was, I, I got to preach on, um, on Trinity Sunday uh, for a, a, at, a, at a conference, a theology, Catholic theology conference. Um, and I think opportunities for women and, and everyone, lay people, men, um, to exercise that sort of theological agency mm -hmm. to be Pope Francis. I love all of the words Pope Francis uses because when they're translated into English, they're just kind of like a little bit weird enough to make you kind of to spark your imagination. So he uses the word protagonists a lot. And, um, but, but we usually just use that to talk about like the main character of a book. Um, but in Latin America and Spanish and probably other Romance languages too, like uh, protagonist is a, is a it has a much bigger meaning. And even it's like a verb, like protagonizar, like, and it's it, like to be a protagonist is to, is to be an agent, right? It's to, it's to have agency, it's to um, understand oneself um, sort of as in our fullness, um, as, as made in the image of God. Um, and so that's, that's a word that Pope Francis uses a lot. And I, and I think that that's, the question for me is, you know, at, at what point is the church going to recognize the protagonism of women? Um, and, and, I, and I pray for that to, to hasten. Yeah. Yes, sir. I love your uh, discussion around solidarity. Uh, you know, I only really love God to the degree that I love the person that I like the least. 
That one always gets me. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I'm always very convicted by that quote because because some because I, I, I some people I like the least, um, and it, 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 it reveals to me just how how ungenerous I can be with others. Um, and I think that that's I I like I love Dorothy Day in general, but I like that quote especially because often we think of solidarity in this very activist key, right? Like it's a project. Mm -hmm. um, but like solidarity is about love. Like it's, it's, it's a movement of love. Like if you read, you know, biographies of, of like, of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, like they're, you know, they're using the language of solidarity. Um, but but it, Chavez has this gorgeous quote about, about solidarity being an act of love, mm -hmm. basically. Like, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we love each other. We love God. Um, you know, when we're in solidarity with one another, it gives us the freedom um, to to love one another. I mean, that's that that's what I think the that's what's so special I think about liturgy also and like in ritual in general, but especially the liturgy is like ritual is like a template for sort of acting like the kind of community we wish we could be all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like if I I can't just like go up to a stranger in Publix and be like, isn't it just so beautiful that we're all fundamentally connected? We're <laughs> relational beings. Like, can I hold your hand? Can, let's just hold hands right now. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh no. Um, but but he, in a space, right, in a ritual space, um, you, can do, you, know, you can do that. You get to sort of perform these deep truths about, about our interconnectedness. It's, you know, we drink from the same cup. Like, you don't do that. In general, you know, we, we hold hands, you embrace, we walk together, we sing together, we we talk together, um, and it's it's practice, right? It's practice for being the kind of community we wish we could always be. And at the root of that, right, is is love. Um, and so I, yeah, I think, yeah, every time I read that, I think I think my I think my mom cut that out of a church bulletin once, actually, and like put it on my placemat when I was a teenager because I was being you know, not very nice. And I was always being owned by quotes from the church bulletin. But yeah, so Dorothy Day is a remarkable example of solidarity. Also because she refused to sort of parcel out like liturgical devotion from like the work of social justice. She was a deeply pious person. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm gonna make sure we have time for others. We have time for one more question. Yeah, Nick. <laughs> you know, going through whatever else you were really going to do, and well, whether or not these things out, it's all too late. There's just none of that. And I'm curious what kind of examples you uncover of that type of um, resistance to all the in your research. So, just to re for the live stream, there's a question about um, what kind of examples of resistance to authority uh, did you find, particularly, uh, well, any kind? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that what I found was that the, the ideal situation is that there wasn't resistance, right? It was, you, you had a priest who, who celebrated the agency of lay people, and you had lay people who had a tradition of leadership because they had to, because they didn't have a priest half the time because mm -hmm. men were refusing assignments to the inner city. Um, and so they, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, let's experiment with lay leadership. It was like, if we're gonna keep being a church, um, we need to lead it ourselves. Um, and so they did. And so you get this very robust tradition of lay leadership. Um, and at many points throughout the history of the parish, um, those things were working in tandem. And also there was a really robust presence of, of women religious at the parish and still is too. So they also were, were kind of part of that work. But in other cases, you know, it's, there was resistance. Um, and most of that resistance 
I mean, after like the first half century of, of terror, um, most of that came somewhat recently, kind of once when I was there and, and beyond, because that's after all of the parish consolidations started. So you had these clusters of parishes with one administrator who was responsible for the you know, care of three or four parishes. And it's just, first of all, it's just, it's a lot. It's also like a lot of different community dynamics. It's hard, to, it's really hard to do that well. Mm -hmm. um, but St. Mary's also currently is in the midst of a, a, pa a, a pastor who's been there for like 11 years now, um, who has a very particular way of doing things and really was a big source of division in the community when he first got there. Um, he was, he's part of the Neocatechumenal Way and brought like a very specific sort of spiritual uh, practice to the community and, and caused a lot of division, especially within the Spanish community. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to see. Um, but I, I remember a lot of the women, especially um, during this period that was really painful, saying, well, we'll just have to teach him what it means to be part of this parish. Um, <laughs> just have to teach him. Almost like they weren't really worried. Um, they're just, we'll just have to teach him. And when I go back now and I talk to them and I'm like, what's the update? Um, the, the highest compliment that they give, and it is a compliment, is say, he has really learned. <laughs> <laughs> He's really learned. And that's, they mean that very often. He's really learned. And that's, you know, because, I mean, sometimes we don't have a mode of, of authority, I think, unfortunately, in the church, maybe at its best, but in practice, not so much, where there's, there's openness to, like, real learning, because mm -hmm. learning requires vulnerability. Um, and I think that there's a fear that if there's any sort of expression of vulnerability or, like, a two-way give and take, then, um, then the trust in the structure will, will fold in mm -hmm. on itself. Um, and so as a result, there's a defensiveness, right? And there's this sense of, I know what I'm doing, um, right? And you know your place, and I know my place, and I got this. Um, because it's, um, we're afraid of weakness, mm. right? I think people, especially in um, an all-male clergy as well, um, there's, a, there's a fear of, of weakness. Um, there's a need to justify. I think there's clergy are not having a great time of it right now. I mean, it's... It, it has to be said. Uh, I think it's very hard to be a priest in the church today um, for, a, for a number of reasons. Um, and I think that too can um, lead to a kind of um, a need to justify one's, one's position, one's existence as, as clergy. Um, and therefore, right, you don't kind of come off like, you know, don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just, it creates this distance, right, which is kind of a tragedy. And so for them to say, he has really learned, right? That's, that was, that's a high compliment. But there was many, there was many, many examples of, of sort of tactical resistance and also, um, and also overt resistance. But I would say typically the resistance wasn't to the priest, actually. It was to the archdiocese that was constantly trying to shut them down. Mm. This has been so great. And it was a celebration on a couple of levels. First of all, for us at the Aquinas Center, um, and all of uh, the, the sort of Catholic community at Candler were really incredibly proud of Susan and the work that she's done. Yeah. This, this book is wonderful, and um, I've already been told by all kinds of students about how much they love you as a teacher as well. And so it, that's a celebration. But it's also uh, a celebration for this, this parish, um, St. Thomas More. Uh, both Gabby and Susan are parishioners here, and they were so kind to partner with us. Um, Andy uh, was great uh, in terms of you know, bringing this about here. And um, I, I was so grateful that they were willing and wanted to celebrate the accomplishment that you did. And Gabby, you did an amazing job um, as well. And I'm so glad that you did this. We have cake. And, That's the important thing. Uh, we have coffee and tea. And most importantly, we have copies of the book. And uh, Susan's publisher was really good to give us a fantastic discount, and so we're selling it at cost, $17.50. Um, and I'm pretty sure the author's here to sign it. 
And so Absolutely. if you're willing and able to stay, that would be wonderful. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thanks so much, Greg. Can I give you a hug?